Hey, what's up, Vox and Hops heads? I'm Matt, the vocals of Crypto C, and you're listening to my podcast, Vox and Hops, where I sit down with fellow metal musicians to talk about their lives, music, and craft beer. I hope that you have had a great weekend. I personally had a wonderful weekend. It was beautiful here in Montreal, and I got to go outside with my children and my family, which is always a blessing, and I really, really appreciate getting out of the house safely of course keeping our distance from everyone else but it's still nice to go and lie down in the grass and watch your children play it almost felt like life was back to normal on today's episode i am with mike pilot the guitarist and vocalist of herod here it is vox and hops episode number 144 i warn you what you are about to hear is very disturbing indeed Hey, what's up, everyone? Today I'm with Mike Pilot from Herod, and I am super stoked to be with you because uh, I do lots of interviews, and most of the time I'm a, like a fan of the band, but I think I'm really a fan of of Herod. I've been I've been really diving into it uh, for the past year. When your Somba de Saint came out is really when I got hooked. Oh yeah, and it's all Chris Noth's fault. So uh, that <laughs> we got to blame uh, the Swiss machine. <laughs> <laughs> for introducing me to you we were on hell over europe 2 alongside aborted he was tming that run and uh, he was like, yeah yeah i have a band for you you're gonna like this and i did and i've been pushing Great. it around to, to a bunch of my friends as much as i can oh man thanks how are you how are you handling the madness that is covid19 yeah it's we we live in crazy times that's for sure um it's kind of weird for me because aside from doing the band, I'm a self-employed uh, music tutor. So I teach uh, drums, guitar, bass, ukulele, singing, and I usually travel to students' houses as well as sometimes having the students come here in my studio at the back of my house. Um, so can't do that anymore. <laughs> um, but luckily we have this this uh, this nice little app here, Zoom. So I'm teaching remotely and it's actually working surprisingly well. It is very interesting because I was I was super opposed to doing any Vox and Hops interviews mm. unless it was face to face, and it would have been impossible if it wasn't for apps like this that work just so yeah. well and are so solid and consistent. And I still find that I I can make a connection with someone, albeit yeah, not sure. as not as fluid as when you're face to face in yeah. a crowded craft beer bar. But it's 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 <laughs> done pretty well. Yeah. Which, so uh, we're lucky that this whole horrible crisis is happening when, when technology has reached a point. This is true. That we can actually keep in contact when we're not allowed to be together. Yeah. Shout out to Zoom. Thank you, guys. Shout out to Zoom. Uh, Vox and Hops is all about hanging out with my metal friends, talking about their lives, their music, and craft beer. What beer do you have on your side? Show me what you got. Oh... Yes, Brewdog Clockwork Tangerine. I don't believe I've had that one. I'm a huge Brewdog fan, of course, whenever I'm through the UK. This, this, is, this is a special moment, you know. I haven't drank in quite a while. Really? Let's touch yeah, yeah. on that. Why, why, why is that? Um, I had some stomach problems, of, well, since day one of my life, and recently figured out that uh, because I was producing so much acid, I have this uh, condition called Barrett's esophagus, which means that my esophagus just above my stomach, uh, the cells have mutated and I have extra acid producing cells. So this isn't the best for me if I drink it all the time, which I did. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think, I think moderation is fine and I'm really happy to, to meet you, make a new friend and celebrate it with one or two of these guys. Well, well thank you for sacrificing your, your comfort <laughs> in the name of metal. Yes, and and, and the, the, your your stomach uh, condition sounds very metal too. Oh yeah, <laughs> Barrett's esophagus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me on my side, I am drinking uh, Echo Session Ale. This is a their hazy session IPA. It clocks in at three point nine percent. And normally, I do not like session beers, but but Echo Session Ales make the best session beers here in Quebec. Huge oh, yeah? shout out to uh, their brewer, their mastermind, JF Lejantzi for coming by and dropping me off a few of these so that I could use them during my interviews. Uh, I'm a very lucky man, and I have very nice friends, so thank you, JF, <laughs> and 
And well, everyone listening to this, if you are in Quebec and you want to be a responsible parent, a responsible day drinker, Echo, Echo Session <laughs> Ales is the way for it. Is the way that you can do that. So cheers, yes. let's crack these open. Yeah, man, let's do it. Oh, yeah. You going to pour it out? Is there a, a method? Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that glass. Wow. Come on, baby. Here we go. Yes, let's sir. Let's get this cheers. The, the classic... Vox and Hops branded nine ounce tasting glass. It is the glass that I use to drink beer at home most of the time. So wh where are you right now? It looks like some kind of spiral thing behind you. Yeah, yeah. We, we decorated uh, each. We live. We bought our, con our condo six years ago here in Montreal, and instead of painting, we just put up big wall prints in, in one one wall, a big wall print in every room. Cheers. Looks cool. Cheers, man. Ooh, it's good. It's good. Oh, I really man. don't like session beers normal type. Normally, but I this one's still got some bite to it, and it's still juicy, uh, tropical. Like, I love it. I love it. This this is kind of tropical tasting. Um, really nice with the tangerine. It's super light. Damn, I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> He's down the spiral. He went. Yes, the spiral <laughs> staircase behind me. Yeah, uh, Brewdog is a, a staple for Cryptopsy. Whenever we go through, me being who I am. I would always just end up at a brew dog, no matter where yeah. I was. In, in yeah, England. sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, they, they exploded over here, right? It is cool that they've they've taken like a craft beer approach. I know it's it's a lot of people will argue that it's not craft beer anymore, that it's been bought out and it's probably bigger than. Yeah, and they like franchised it out, but it's very hipster how they've done it, and I enjoy it. Yes, it's it's a, I same. Like the, the <laughs> it's like a, a warehouse feeling in most of the the franchises. Yeah, and I yeah. just like being able to go get drink good craft beer. I know that in, in England it's a bit different with the hand pump ales, and they might not be into craft beer. How did you? Let's take me down your beer path. Do you remember your first beer? Oh, my first beer! Wow. I probably I probably took it from my dad. Uh, I think it was Skull, it's S K O L, Skull. It didn't didn't taste good, but <laughs> but perseverance. <laughs> yeah, and then I think my my usual drink um, was Guinness. Actually, I used to drink a lot of Guinness. I love it. Um, but my introduction to to craft craft ales was through these guys through Brewdog. Um, me and my wife Sarah we we were in Manchester with some friends and like oh what's this place and it looked amazing from the outside because I mean you know look at the packaging it's always it's always really cool and enticing and we went into the bar and it was kind of like you said like a warehouse feeling um, a lot of the benches and chairs are made up of like old school like a uh, primary school tables and chairs that's and super cool you know you can see people have like scrawled graffiti on it and stuff and i, I kind of like that that's it's cool it's the metal in us yes <laughs> <laughs> do you remember what beer you ordered that day when you went into brew dog for the first time uh i think it was a punk ipa actually yeah that was my first too i think the first time i had that i could be wrong here i was playing in tilburg and uh every time you play in tilburg in Holland, you always, always, always end up at the Little Devil, right. which is this small little smoky. I guess it. I remember being smoky. I don't know if they still smoke there now. And I think that's the first time I ever had a punk, punk IPA. So huge shout out to Little Devil. Yeah, I'll be back there soon once all this shit's <laughs> done with. <laughs> Take me back to your youth. You're growing up in your house. What music was playing when you were a child and you were not in control of the radio? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, very first exposure to me realizing how much I love music was by watching uh, a film. The greatest film of all time, The Blues Brothers. Really? Okay. Damn. Yeah, man. I was sing singing along to every song. Aretha Franklin, what a powerful voice. It's incredible. Um, but then the, the thing that really got me was when my dad gave me Led Zeppelin II. Um, and a bunch of Queen records. And then I was kind of set like wow i need to do this somehow what town did you grow up in and was it a big town a small town yeah it's pretty big i'm still still there it's a place called warrington it's in between manchester and liverpool cool yeah so so was it easy to find like-minded people to help make this dream a reality <laughs> well um it, i was just listening to the records for years and then uh when i met my lifelong best friend Stuart Fagan. Um, 
we met each other when I moved moved primary schools when I was nine years old. Um, we clicked straight away, and he played me uh, he played me some Metallica, some Metallica. I think on one side of the tape, it was some of the Black Album, and on the other side of the tape, it was uh, the Offspring Smash. <laughs> Something our children will never know. Yeah, yeah. The and big tapes. I know, right? And uh, yeah, they just got played over and over again. And a couple of years later, we got into high school. And there was, you know, there was drums in the music room. There was some guitars. And I just saved, saved up as much as I could. Uh, got a guitar rig. Um, and then a friend gave me, I think he, he had like dial-up internet. And he downloaded this huge file of uh, all of Nirvana's songs, every album, one after the other, bam, 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 just in tab. Uh, so I didn't have a teacher. I just looked at the tab, played the notes. I was a huge Nirvana fan. St still am, really. Um, so, I, yeah, I learned pretty much every Nirvana song, and that's how I learned how to play. And along this journey, uh, my friend Stu, he really got into drums, so we were just constantly playing together all the time. How how do you justify now you being a teacher and having learnt without a teacher? What 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 is your approach on that? Do you think it would have been better for you to have a mentor? Would you have learned faster? Yeah, I think so. I think I, I, think I would have, uh, for sure. Um, but, it, you know, t times, were, times were tough. Um, you know, affo affording a tutor wasn't really an option. Um, so the, the way I kind of approach... Uh, my teaching is I kind of I kind of jam with my students so I, I'm trying to teach them the way I learned by jamming with my friend finding out about each other you know we'll, we'll write songs together we'll play cover songs um, I'm never really too strict on theory because it's something I taught myself after many years of just playing and thinking I know it all um, <laughs> and you know kids can get really bored with with a uh, theory stuff but you know I, I teach that too uh just try and approach it in in a fun way i guess yes it's very important uh when when learning music and a lot of not a lot of people know this they just want to jump into and just learn as much as possible but the first thing that you really have to appreciate is actually listening exactly yes yeah. so so listening to yourself listening to the other person in the room what that's why i thought it was interesting you said that you jam with them yeah, so I when we have composition pieces, which we, we quite often do, um, I'll say, if, if I've got a drummer that I'm teaching, I've always got a guitar with me. So I'll say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this riff for you, and I want you to play a drum beat that accents the riff, you know? So, like, I don't know, maybe an upstroke is a snare hit, downstroke is a kick. And then we'll, we'll write that section, and I'll say, okay, now you write... A drum part and I'll accent it so they write it then I play something over it and you usually ends up sounding pretty cool actually ha have you ever set up students to become a band together well I have uh, I have a group lesson tomorrow um, there's like this competition that's happening at a, a little place near, near where I live uh, I think it's like Gra all has got talent I think it's called and um, they've called themselves the Grappen Hall gangsters <laughs> <laughs> yes, and they're, they're playing. Uh, I've been teaching them how to play. The, oh, sorry, it's a drummer, a keyboard player, a singer, and I'm playing guitar with them. And we're doing um, "I Want to Break Free" by Queen. Cool. So, k kind of, you know, it's it's it's, uh, it, it's it really could fun. Be, it could be the beginning of something where they make a connection in this band and then move on. Exactly. Exactly. And then fire you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, I'll, I'll be happy when they don't need me because I'll, I'll, I'll know my job is done. You know, that's 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 the whole point. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's let's go back. Uh, what about your first time on stage? I was maybe twelve or thirteen. It was a, a biker festival in Wales, um, and the guys I'd been playing with, uh, what were we called? I think we were called antisocial personality disorder. <laughs> you fit, the, fit that on one backdrop. <laughs> yeah. And, and we just played like tons of... Uh, I was drumming in that band, actually. Uh, we played lots of Nirvana covers, uh, Sex Pistols, Guns N' Roses, that kind of thing. Yeah, and they asked us to play for like two hours, 
<laughs> so can, can you imagine these kids not really knowing how to play their instrument, just grinding away, giving everybody a headache for two hours? <laughs> and when, when you say biker, you mean motorcyclists. Oh, yeah, 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 sure. Cool, yeah. The, 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 that's cool that they support uh, the young artists. Yeah, I think it was like, a, I think a, a friend of one of the guy's families like hosted the event or something like that. And they let us stay there overnight, and like we camped out in the tent, drinking beers. I was going to uh, say, did you party? Yeah, <laughs> yeah of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, sorry, mom. <laughs> those are the best. Those early gigs, and then you'd party afterwards. It was almost half as much fun the party, yeah. and then the gig. Yeah, in sure. my mind, back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> now it's all business. Yes. Yeah. Well, you need to take care of yourself as well, though. I guess. It is important to find some balance, as we were mentioning earlier. Mm. Yeah, man. Let's touch on Herod. I, I'm such a fan. There's just such a dynamic to the band. It is like uh, the bastard love child of... Oh, it's so hard to, to put so many things together that you love. It's like a, a little bit of Gojira, a little bit of Meshuga, and a little bit of uh, Mastodon at moments. Oh, yeah? Cool. That's what I find, yeah. Nice. Nice description. Yeah, we can thank uh, Pierre Carroll for... For that, he's the he's the mastermind behind the riffs. Really? Okay, cool. Uh, what? Where do you think uh, this band is going? I know it's hard right now with the the current situation, but uh, yeah, I I see you guys being a huge band. I would hope for the same, and <laughs> we uh, thank you very much for that. We we all we all kind of want that, you know. Um, I don't think that this time should be seen as that negative for bands because it's the time to get creative you know there's frustration in the air we have many many tools at our disposal to be able to create stuff and collaborate online so you know we we just have to kind of step it up get out of the fog and get your creative juices flowing you know does that mean you guys are writing something new that means we might be. <laughs> that, that makes me very happy. <laughs> oh, good. How else do you think artists uh, can can move forward throughout this, aside from just writing? Uh, that's a good question. And I guess, I mean, you know, I'd be a bad teacher if I didn't say we should be, uh, we should be practicing and refining, refining our skills. We should definitely be doing that. Um, we should be loving those who are close to us in our house, you know. Um, love the people around you just with a two meter radius <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah I mean th there's there's plenty of things we could think about doing it, it's it's a matter of I guess it's a matter of bandwidth because you know I could see if this thing doesn't go away for a while people want to see shows you know there's, there's lots of people who are doing like you know acoustic live streams and stuff and that's really cool but It'd be kind of cool if there was like a, you know, a metal gig with a, I don't know if, I don't know, maybe a venue could be rented and it could be like a live stream, but, you know, there's no audience there. It's just the band. I'm not sure if that would be allowed or not, or if there's a decent enough uh, latency fix to have people in their respective home studios jamming it out together and sending it out live. I don't know. I like the idea, but... Not sure how that would work. We need we need the tech savvy people out there because I've been thinking yeah. of the same thing. I don't know if I mentioned on the podcast yet that I'm thinking of here in Montreal setting up something exactly like that, where it's a live show situation. We need them to lift the small gathering ban, hmm. which is not going to happen for quite some time, sadly. Or we can get permits maybe because it's work related. Yeah, and then it would be like an, either in a small venue or in a studio that we deck out with lights and do a real live stream metal performance. The issue is the sound. It's it's, it's easy to do. Yeah, to do to do an acoustic set with one camera. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's it's it still sounds good, but to get a metal show sounding right and to look right and have all of the the cuts right. Everyone has to know the band, has to know the song, and it's very expensive to set up. So, yeah, it's I'm a still military tinkering. operation. Yeah. I'm still tinkering on my side of how to how to make this a reality. I'm I'm glad that you're thinking about it, though. That's that's cool. I think it's an it's a necessity. People still want to be a part of music. Yeah, sure. Especially you know us musicians, we see it as a it's our it's our lives. But there's a lot of people that their lives is loving our music. 
Yeah. And they're willing to pay more. They, you know, they, they can only own so many shirts. <laughs> yeah, so many black shirts. <laughs> they, they want something <laughs> tangible for their yeah. for their money, and it's a, an experience that they can't get elsewhere right now. So, I'm trying to think that through. I, I, if anyone out there can help me, I have a few people in mind that have a, a perfect team to set this up. If anyone's listening and can 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 send me a message, I would I would greatly appreciate that. Cool. <laughs> Take me to. Uh, You've done lots of tours. Uh, notably, you guys toured with Carcass. Am I right about this? Ah, well, Herod did tour with Carcass, but not with me. Um, oh. I, I, I know. At, at that time, I was I was just, just a fan. Just a fan. Um, I really wanted to go see them, actually, on that tour, the Death Crusher tour. So you've got, uh, what, Voivod, Napalm Death, Carcass, and Obituary, and Herod. So it's a pretty big package. And I think um, I would have missed them anyway because Herod ended up going on at like, I don't know, five o'clock, something like that, real, really early. Um, but I, I was playing in a, like a, a wedding function band for a little while with a tiny cocktail kit, just, just jamming it out. Um, and yeah, I had a gig on the same night. I tried every other session drummer that I knew. So come on, please, I need to see Herod. Make it work. Couldn't, couldn't work. So I didn't see him, but they, you know, I got to join the band. So <laughs> that's what, was that, what was that moment like being a fan? It's that rock star, the movie moment <laughs> <laughs> when, when you get to join a band that you're actually a fan of. What was that like? Yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty special. It was cool. Do you, do you already know the story of how that happened or? I do not know. No. Okay. Well, let me regale it to you. Um, so I, I, I tend not to ask the "How did you get joined the band?" question, but oh, if it's okay. interesting and you want to talk, it you can go for it. Oh, uh, it was, it was kind of cool. Um, when I used to sing in the ocean years and years ago, um, one of the guys who recorded a lot of their records and helped with live sound, Julian Fellman. Hey, Julian. Um, I stayed friends with him and all of the other guys too after I left the band. And I went to go see him one year. He played me the first album, um, the one they were touring on. And he was like, I think you're really going to like this. There's some kind of neurosis, Cult of Luna, Meshuggah. I think it's for you. I'm like, okay, wow, this this is actually really, really great. Um, the next year, he came over to the UK to see me and my wife. And he said, oh, yeah, they, uh, they need a singer now. So I just... Later, after a few beers, I just text text Herod on a uh, on a uh, Facebook like, hey, you know, you might know me as the singing the ocean. I know a load of guys who you know. Can we make this happen? You know, let's have an audition. And they sent me a track over, and I was away in Scotland, so I took a well, my friend took his laptop and a tiny Pro Tools rig into this like 100 year old cottage in the middle of nowhere with no internet connection, which was great because that was the idea of the holiday to detach and and do that. And uh, <laughs> Guys, he points uh, yeah. to his beer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'd screamed my balls off in this in this room and then wandered around for about an hour outside with uh, my cell phone in the air, trying to find the reception to, to send it to him. And it went through and I got the gig. That's oh, fucking awesome. Cool. Yeah, it was cool. <laughs> you sang for the ocean? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what records? Uh, it was just, uh, well, two records, actually. Precambrian in 2007. But there are so many vocalists on that album. There are so many guests. Um, but I probably took around 60% of the vocals on there. I also tracked bass, because I originally joined them as a bass player. But slowly took over. <laughs> um, <laughs> did not at all <laughs> um, yeah yeah so mo moved on to vocals and then Robin wanted to make a kind of remix an edit of an album they did called Fluxion so we did Fluxion version 2.0 originality I like it and uh, yeah I tracked a load of vocals on that that's amazing also a huge fan of the ocean I felt like there was a connection but now I, now I get it yeah, yeah, that's the, they're, they're kind of the reason I ended up ended up with a band, and it's cool, you know. I didn't leave on bad terms, so it was awesome to go out on tour with them uh, last year, and great to have Loic come up and sing sing a track with us most nights because he sings a he sings a track on the on the album um, Morning Grounds, and yeah, great. 
All, all good. All friends. All friends here. It's beautiful. Yeah, and, and, and Herod is on Pelagic Records. Am I right? Or am I crazy? That No, you're, you're not crazy. Which is also run by people from the ocean. <laughs> yeah. It's a small, dirty little circle. Oh, yeah. So dirty. <laughs> <laughs> what would be a dream tour? You mentioned that, that Crazy Carcass tour would be a dream tour, which had you been on it. Um, touring with the ocean is cool. Uh, what would be a band that, that you wish that you could tour with that you haven't had a chance with yet? Oof, that's a good question. That's a very, very good question. Um, M- Mastodon, I guess. Mastodon, Gojira, oof, that would be amazing. Meshuga, of course. Uh, yeah, that would be a dream come true. But uh, yeah, it'll be a, maybe it might be different if we talk about bands that don't exist anymore, but... Yeah, I guess I guess that would be that would be amazing. Mastodon are incredible, so good. It's not even funny how good they are. <laughs> I bet they're busy right now. They're in so many projects. I bet they're busy right now, creating a whole bunch of shit right now. Yeah, sure. What would be the worst experience you've ever had on the road? Hmm. Huh. Worst experience. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, on tour with the Ocean sometime around 2008, and we, we were playing in uh, the Underworld in Camden. Yes, of course. Yeah. So, my then girlfriend, but now wife, I was going to meet her the next day in Sheffield. So I thought, okay, played the show, everything was great, loaded out, I'm going to grab some food, I'm going to go to bed, I'm going to be responsible. Okay, so walk, walked off on my own. I went to the, I went to some, I don't know, like some kebab shop or something like that. Got something to eat, and uh, but before that happened, the crucial part of the story is I went to a, a cash point to get some cash out to get some food, and this this girl, like this addict, just starts talking to me. Um, just you know, she clearly wants money. Like I'm, I'm not gonna. I'm not going to bust out a note for you. You know, I'm a touring musician. No. <laughs> Sorry, not going to happen. And she starts just... She started rambling about Irvin Welsh. You know? Okay. You know? Yeah? <laughs> Re- really bizarre. So she's... Yeah, she's pretty... She's pretty out there. Anyway, she follows me into this place. I paid for my food. And then when the guy was handing me my change, she just swooped in and grabbed it. Swooped in and grabbed it. And I'm... You know, I'm, I'm not a violent guy. Um... But, you know, I'm broke <laughs> and I need that money. So I, I just grabbed her hand and said, you know, what do you think you're doing? You know, give me my money, give me my money. And there was there was kind of a, a little bit of a, a tussle. And I just said to the guy who was behind uh, the counter, right, lock the door, call the police. There you go. Done. I need my money back. Uh, and he did that. And she kind of broke free. <laughs> Um, and then she uh, she put the money inside of herself. No. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> yes. So I wasn't I, I wasn't getting was that it, back. Was it coins or? Um, well, it was coins and like it was coins and like a ten pound note, and okay. she just she just scrunched it up and went to town. And me and the me and the guy in the in the shop are like, what is happening here? Um, so I had to explain it to the police and blah, blah, blah. Never got the money back. But the funny thing about it is that it earned me the nickname Pussy Purse for the rest of the tour. <laughs> so there you go. True, true story, kids. That, 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 is, uh, that is up there on one of the worst out of all. <laughs> yeah, so, oh, boy. Pussy Purse. Jesus. Yeah. Wow, she was more desperate than you. Yeah. 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 How about you? Oh, there's so many. There's so many. <laughs> We'll keep it all about you this one. <laughs> okay. One last question. You don't drink anymore, but you used to drink. What is What was your hangover cure? Bloody Mary. It's got to be. Get back on it. <laughs> what, was yeah. it about, what is it about a Bloody Mary that, that sets people straight? I'm not sure if, if it's the amount of like vitamins you're getting from the from the tomato juice or whether it's that really nice kick because I liked it really spicy and lots of pepper and Tabasco sauce or whether you're just getting a huge hit of vodka and (laughs) going for it again you know not sure how about you oh I I 
suffer in silence. <laughs> <laughs> I got two little kids, so so uh, yeah. hangovers still hurt, and we're we're getting older, right? So, lots of water, and uh, lots of coffee, and a nice smile. There you go, and, and be a good father still, because uh, they didn't drink the night before I did. Yeah, yeah, that's that's beautiful. Well said. Yeah, Mike, thank you so much for coming, Pleasure. hanging out with me, suffering yeah. the consequences of drinking a craft beer. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. Cheers, brother. Everyone listen to Harry. <laughs> Take care, man. Hey, thank you all so, so much for listening right to the end. You know that I love and appreciate that. I am such a huge fan of Herod. You guys absolutely need to check them out. If you don't know who they are, you have to listen to this band. Sombre de Saint is a fantastic album. I can't praise them enough. So just just stop listening to me right now and go listen to that album and tell me that I'm wrong. It's, it's, it's a fantastic album. Huge shout out to Mike. Super glad that I got the chance to meet you. Massive thanks to Chris Knopf, the Vox and Hops alumni, for setting this one up for me. I greatly appreciated that. I hope you guys have a good rest of the week. I have two more episodes coming at you, one on Wednesday and another on Friday. But until then, remember to enjoy life, metal, and craft beer. Cheers, Vox and Hops heads. Oh,